welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and on today's episode we are joined by Mark Lawrence on publication day of the book that broke the world. Hello Mark. Hello. How How is everything? How is your journey today? A oh, little crowded. I had to, <laughs> to put up with fantasy author Luke Skull but uh, yes. apart from that it was, uh, it was good. It's going to be heckling from the sidelines I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> so it's, it's always tricky when we're talking about a second book. Um, so <laughs> I suppose what what can you tell us about the series and then if there's any like non-spoiler things for the new book? I can tell you about <laughs> my books. Um, that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> I've always been very terrible at the elevator pitch side of things. Um, and people tend to have to drag facts out of me, but I'm good at generalities. Um, and these, so this is my 16th and 17th book, uh, my sixth trilogy, um, and it's got nothing to do with any of the stuff that came before, so people can leap in here. Um, the, there are epigraphs in front of each chapter and they have some gentle nods to my previous books, but it's not mm. like it's plumbed in, it's just yes. sort of um, fun. Um, and the books are, it's called the Library Trilogy, so officially it's the Library Trilogy Trilogy, which I <laughs> pointed out to them, but they said, no, let's go with it. Um, and uh, it's set in a, a massive library primarily. Um, and it's probably, I don't want to scare anyone off, it's the closest to a, a literary book that I have come <laughs> in, in as much as whilst there is lots of running around and, and people catching arrows and, and um, excitement, even some kissing. Um, <laughs> there, there are a number of themes that are, are being addressed as well, so mm -hmm. you can ignore them, but, but they are there. And it, it talks um, in part about the, uh, the impact of accumulating information and things like the difference between information and knowledge and, and whether it's a good idea to have free access to uh, information because um, it can be dangerous stuff mm -hmm. um, and people can use it in the, in the wrong way. Um, so having this massive library with all of um, the accumulated wisdom of not just our species but lots of other species, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's a kind of Everyone says libraries are good. Mm -hmm. I say libraries are good, uh, <laughs> and and they are. But mm -hmm. if this information predates your own society and the societies that have come before you have destroyed themselves, mm. then maybe you shouldn't instantly have the the blueprints of the nuclear weapon they used to do it. <laughs> uh, and, and that sort of uh, discussion un un underlies a lot of it, um, which makes it all sound a bit dry. But no, there, there's there's plenty of. Um, falling off things and things going on fire. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the good stuff. All the good stuff. <laughs> so your um, previous series have tended to kind of focus on a kind of sole uh, protagonist and you're kind of seeing everything almost from that one person's kind of POV. Um, here we kind of have, well, multiple POV. So why the change? And was did you find this more of a challenge kind of keeping track of everyone? Well, I mean, change is probably um, what, what defines my writing <laughs> in that none of the, the six trilogies that I've written are particularly similar to each mm. other um, and this is generally held to be a bad idea because if you establish a readership uh, and then you veer off into something else a large number of them are sort of mm. thrown off the train um, so the, the received wisdom is to continue in writing variations on the same mm -hmm. theme for 30 books in a row if you if you can manage it um, but I, I get bored very easily, so this is why I write trilogies that, that I mm -hmm. really wouldn't want to stick with anything for, for, <laughs> for much longer than that. And I tend not to read any um, series that are much longer than that. Mm. I have yeah. in the past. I was saying to Luke, I'd read um, the uh, 13 books of a series of unfortunate events to, ah, my, to my daughter, but um, yes. that's oh. probably the longest series I've ever read. <laughs> so so I, get, I get bored and I change things up. Um, and... Yes, I have written a lot of books with a, a single 
um, point of view. Um, though in some of those I have sort of bounced out using various techniques to, to pull extra points of view in. And there's, there's, there's pros and cons, but I felt it was time to explore. Um, and certainly this book, it, it does need that contrast. You can, there's lots of, um, I'll call them games, that you can play uh, in a narrative if you have two views. And that's kind of ties into the theme of the, the books in that um, <clears throat> the, the library um, is a kind of analog for the internet and the librarians are a kind of analog for search engines and for people who control what information is it comes out to you and so one of the, th the themes is how the same facts can be viewed or same information can be viewed from by two different people from two different perspectives and they can come away with very different variations mm -hmm. that they then take out as their stories about what happened um, and by having two points of view here i'm able to look at various situations from two angles mm -hmm. and then illustrate my my theme not in such a dry manner, <laughs> but it comes home to you that maybe um, th these people's take on something, um, they're seeing the same thing, but they're coming away with very different ideas about what mm -hmm. they've seen. Yes. Uh, and in this book, there's two points of view. In here, I think we broaden it out to, uh, to four. Right, interesting. Okay, and is there um is there some you touched on kind of the different species earlier? Is there some new uh, animal folk in? Yes, yes, we, we, <laughs> we have we have extra extra species. Um, <laughs> uh, some some rather unpleasant insectoids who are kind of used as a sort of uh, device to put pressure on everyone and mm -hmm. raise the stakes. Interesting. <laughs> so. Did your initial idea for this series kind of come from your own kind of um, love of books and kind of your first experiences with books and reading? Because I think I read something about your mom was a librarian. She was. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, the origin story that I've told, which is that. Um, so I came. I was born in America and came over here um, when I was one year old. Um, and I think one of my earliest memories is that my mother was working as a librarian and, and would take me into work with her a lot and I would be wandering around this library and it, I've seen it like on the internet now and it's not a huge library but it's quite a nice old building mm -hmm. um, but like when you're two or three years old and you're looking up at these shelves they, they, <laughs> you, you do feel very small and I've tried to sort of recreate that by putting grown people in a much much bigger library mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah I mean when you've written a lot of books <clears throat> there is a natural inclination to start thinking about the whole business of storytelling and the books and how we interact with them. Um, and I, I think a lot of authors go there. Um, hopefully I have uh, given a reasonably fresh spin on it. Because we have had, I suppose recently in particular, some great books about books. I mean, obviously um, looking at like R.F. Quan um, for um, Babel, but also uh, even the new Jasper Ford series which obviously spins off a lot of uh, different kind of book ideas and stuff so yeah I think uh, a lot of authors are, are just uh, book geeks as well which is yeah. great <laughs> I mean I haven't read either of those two but um, there's um, in the Books of Babel by um, Josiah Bancroft mm -hmm. there's a, a, a enormous library that was um, very fun mm -hmm. um, and in um, Wolf's um, books, uh, Shadow of the Torturer, um, then um, there's also an enormous library. And, mm -hmm. and it, 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 as I said, a lot of yes. a lot of authors have an affection for libraries and tend to, <laughs> to stick one in, in their mm -hmm. stories. And here I just made it take over the story rather than just be a feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to kind of, I suppose, the idea of like an a infinite library um, and even trying to comprehend kind of everything, all the ideas and stuff that are stored within. Um, but you have, I suppose there's quite an interesting idea of, um, and again, it's uh, touched on before, the idea of kind of uh, societies kind of starting over and, and like sort of the blueprints of, of how a society should be. And then inevitably, unfortunately, where it, where it can 
kind of go wrong so was this like a um again kind of a overriding idea in in the novels to kind of look at the idea of you know knowledge and too much knowledge and the idea of how this affects society there's certainly um a degree of that yeah the there's a, a book called uh, a moat in god's eye um by larry niven and jerry pornell um and in that they have a, a species that um keeps on annihilating itself and they mm. have these museums that are the most fundamental firm structure in their in their on their planet so that because they can't get off their planet um, and these museums are used to reseed society mm. so I guess that, that was um, part of the inspiration there and the infinite library um, there's while I was writing this everyone was telling me about uh, Keith Borges who, who wrote a, a, a short story um, about an infinite library it was quite mm. a famous one which I read um, in between these two um, so it's obviously not that <laughs> but I, what I was um, trying to get into with my infinity was that, <clears throat> again, like the internet, if I was um, looking at the idea that if you have your own personal opinion, uh, there's, a, there's a line in there, something that says, like, people don't want truth, they want affirmation. Mm -hmm. um, and if you give them a uh, 100 books, uh, 99 of which disagree with them in very logical and clear ways, but one agrees with them. They'll just push the 99 to the side and they'll take the one that they like and they'll hold it up. Mm. Um, and we see this all the time, that people who want to go and do their own research on the internet, they don't want to do their own research. They want to Google away until they find the thing that says what they already believed mm -hmm. and then show everyone that this then proves that they were correct. Um, so th there's a issues here about the librarians being essentially that search engine and they can be a biased search engine mm -hmm. and if the library's big enough you will find on the shelf somewhere something that agrees with you and then we have this um, rather venal and corrupt king outside who um, employs the librarians to find things that support his opinions mm -hmm. and you know there's various commentary on the world around us <laughs> but again I, it's not um, these are things that underlie a story that um, mm -hmm. it's not um, preaching at you it's just sort of and it's saying that there's no good answers to any of these um mm -hmm. there is a, there is a war going on through the trilogy between um two parties um one of which thinks that everyone should have free access to in information and one that thinks that if the society burns itself down it should recreate the information and hope to do better mm -hmm. this time and the library that we have in the story is a compromise between the, the two of those mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that either side of that debate is correct mm -hmm. i'm just saying here's something to think about mm -hmm. while we run away from the monsters yeah <laughs> and is is that a reason as well what um why the uh kind of the characters are or the, at least obviously they start they're quite younger characters so there's almost an element of not wonder as such but you know as a child kind of learning the world for the first time and, and maybe seeing an I idealized view there's, there's two levels to that and it does kind of irk me when people look at books with young characters and say that they must be YA because mm -hmm. there's many reasons for using um, young characters that don't mean that you're pitching your book at a particular level um, and the obvious one doesn't have to be young character but it helps is that when you have a complex um, fantasy world mm -hmm there's a learning curve and that tends to yeah. be why people write trilogies and series because the amount of investment in educating your reader about this world you don't then want to throw that all that away mm -hmm. and, and write a completely new book you want to say Phew, we've got over that mm -hmm. now we can move on and, and take that as read and, and mm -hmm. tell more story um, so you, you often have a young character because then they don't have to have a conversation those fake conversations where they tell someone else as you know, <laughs> and educate yeah. reader, they genuinely don't know themselves and they're asking the questions that the reader would ask mm -hmm. and so there's that process. But also, young characters are, are more interesting because they are more prone to develop and change and so if you want to do character development, um, if you threw me in a story, mm -hmm. I'm less likely to change my opinion <laughs> just because 
I'm old and and a young character is those are the years we're, we're most shaped in and so um, it's interesting to see how events shape people and what parts of them are consistent and can't be turned by uh, some of the nature versus nurture debate and, and that's that's fun to do so that's why one of the reasons I have young characters mm -hmm. um, and you said before as, as well just briefly about um, the monsters so we have to obviously talk about the, the deaf monsters amongst, amongst others so um, where did the idea of um, them come from? Yeah, talking about the, the, the guys who live under the ground. Yes. Well, I think all of us have seen enough nature programs <laughs> to see the old trapdoor spiders yeah. come up oh, and, yeah. and grab you. Um, <laughs> and I think there's actually a D&D &D monster called a, a trapper or something that's, that's basically a sausage with tentacles and it hides itself places and then... Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. I, I don't think those are, are particularly original, but um, they're fun. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, if you go to the effort of putting people on a new planet and put an extra moon in the sky or whatever, you may as well have a few creatures that aren't like squirrels and, and mm. cows. You know. <laughs> um, so I was um, researching for this and I watched a fantastic video that the Brothers Gwyn obviously did, the huge fans of yours, and they've coined the phrase Lorentzian for all of your books. So we're going to try and like make that a, make that a term that sticks. Okay. So. <laughs> in physics, with a different spelling, it already is a, a term. Well, there you know, we go. <laughs> contraction. Uh, it's a part of uh, general rel or special relativity. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, <laughs> to coin new words for fantasy. Um, and we also obviously have to comment on another kind of beautiful cover. Um, just putting these out today, and they just look absolutely stunning together. Um, so uh, yeah. yes, it's um, Tom Roberts yes. who's done magnificent art. And it's a pity that they have titles because they have to kind of um, shade back the bit where the title goes. Uh, but I, Tom sells on his um, website, sort of A2 large uh, posters on yes. this one. I'm sure he'll do the same with that. Mm -hmm. And when you have it in large scale, you just understand the immense detail that's in here. There's, there's pieces here that you can cover with the, the, just a little tiny bit of your nail. And yet when you zoom in, They've got sort of decoration on the pillars and little owl faces and wow. scrolls. So it really is so um, <laughs> immense. Uh, like this this um, raven here that mm. a lot of people don't spot. But when you zoom in, all the feathers are detailed and the eye and the wow. beak, and it's actually a, a really well-drawn raven. So um, yes, props to him. He's, he's a, and he's got his work on um, quite a few covers these days. And, and he'd actually sent like 10 years ago or so um, he sent me a, a piece of his art that I, I've got at home. Um, but this is long before he was doing covers. Mm. Um, he, yeah, he's just a great artist and he's been doing it a long time. Um, and it's nice to see everyone starting to recognise how good he is. Yes, yeah, because he did um, Hannah Kainer's covers yeah, as well. Yeah, they're, again, kind of uh, beautiful, beautiful covers. So, yeah. And I think her cover's actually more in keeping with his general style. Mm. I hadn't seen him do these sort of architectural pictures in in this this way before um it just turns out he's got extra strings to his uh, yes <laughs> um so to finish off the uh interview today so we always like to um obviously ask what's coming up next and also um what you are currently reading watching and playing mm. so uh yeah first things first so i i presume obviously you said trilogy so <laughs> yes there is a, a third book that was written before this one was published um and i think we've agreed to call it the book that held her heart mm -hmm. um and i think that's probably my favorite one of the trilogy to be honest so i'm excited for people to see that it mm -hmm. should come out this time next year and i have been contracted for a new trilogy after that so <laughs> 26, 27, 28, um, which is um, actually, so my first trilogy, uh, The Broken Empire, um, sold very well and a lot of people only know me by it. And so I am forever referred to as that grim dark author, uh, whereas actually of the six trilogies, 
the Broken Empire is the only one that I really consider to be mm. grimdark. Um, and I've never written any grimdark <laughs> since. Uh, but the upcoming trilogy is a lot closer to, to grimdark than, than the others. Um, and this is just a game because I like to weave around and mm. upset all the people <laughs> who who um, liked the previous trilogy. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, I suspect it will be called Dark Fit dark fantasy um, yeah and it's um focused on an older female um protagonist mm -hmm. an old lady if you like um in part because when i'm on forums and things which i often haunt uh, you always see these people saying why are there no older women on, on in these things and i just called their bluff and sort of <laughs> gave them one and, and we'll see if there's if there's a market mm -hmm. for it um, but again, um, I think, yeah, I've written the first one of those and, and I, I, I like it. It's exciting yeah. <laughs> and, and bloodthirsty and, uh, but also it has some, some deeper looks at, uh, what being old is about and mm -hmm. tries to set the person in context of their whole life. Um, and I have various other projects on the bubble at the moment, I'm mm -hmm. writing a book about, uh, emergence of, um, consciousness in AI. Yeah. I'm also writing a sort of something that could run in parallel to the, the library trilogy sort of yeah. in the same universe mm -hmm. and whether these things will um, you know ever get published I don't know but I, when you're quite far ahead of your mm -hmm. publishing schedule it's it's nice to sort of jump into and as I say I do get bored easily so yeah. <laughs> I like to bounce around. <laughs> And Nikki was asking about reading. Yes, yes. So um, if there's anything you're particularly enjoying at the moment, but reading, watching-wise, and uh, gaming. So I've just finished um, what's called a novella, but it's actually a book because it's over the length where you qualify as a book by um, Michael Fletcher and Anna Smith-Spark. Ah, uh, yes. Called yeah. In the Shadow of Their Dying, mm -hmm. which is peak grimdark you know, so <laughs> lots of uh, entrails and and uh, and poo um but yeah that was fun um and i'm reading um i think he's called murakami a, a japanese author quite a famous literary one the, the wind up bird chronicles uh, yeah mm -hmm. um, which i'm I was reading on the train when uh when i got a chance and that was um yeah that's that's interesting it's, mm -hmm. um, very odd book but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the, the best book I've read recently is um, The Daughter's War by um, Christopher Buhlman which uh, is a prequel yes. to The Black Tongue Thief mm -hmm. uh, and he really is a, a wonderful author so I would recommend that one to anyone who's watching. Yeah that does sound because he started off writing horror, horror didn't mm. he and I'm very intrigued about checking out his horror. Yeah so. I, I'm probably going to go back to that I think Between Two Fires yeah. is one of his and there was another one but um, The Black Tongue Thief was where I sort of took note of him because yes. everyone was saying how good it was so I read it and it, it was excellent mm. and The Daughter's War is I feel even a slight notch up above that. Wow. Okay. And any um yeah any pro uh, programs you're watching or any films you've watched? Oh yeah, recently? I'm watching loads. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, when you get your rare Shogun downtime, and, uh, <laughs> I've been suckered into watching Downton Abbey. I like to spread yeah. the net quite, quite wide. <laughs> um, I'm watching Killing Eve. Uh, watched um, Reacher recently. Oh, Reach is fun, isn't it? We need to catch up on Reach. I've ra randomly started watching something which I had no expectations of at all, but seems quite fun, even though it's really kind of cliched in its topics, which are sort of witches and things. But it's called The Bastard Son of the Devil Himself, and I'm quite enjoying that. Yeah, so that's based on a book, a YA novel by Sally Green that came out a few years ago, um, and it's been kind of expanded out. Um, but yeah, we I think we did a big thing at MCM last May, I think, or maybe the year before. Every year, kind of, every convention merges into one eventually. But um, but yeah, it, it did sound it did sound phenomenal. So I did sound very good. And on the games front, I just really don't find time for these things anymore. But I think the last thing I put serious time into was um, The Last of Us Part Two, um, mm -hmm. and then I did pick up um, one of the latest Dooms, but I didn't really get into it. It was 
I like the ones where the weapons feel a bit more chunky. Yeah. This one was all sort of firing glowy light balls of flashy demons, and it was just too <laughs> garish and colourful and no real feeling of gravity to it. So I gave up on that. <laughs> Fair, fair. There's um there's a, a JRPG I was playing last year um called Chained Echoes, which is like an indie JRPG, which is phenomenal. And um there is one part of it where you go, you're kind of looking for these various shards in the world, and you go to this abandoned library, and it did really make me think of your first book because it's um it hasn't been used in like hundreds of years so it's almost like the in-between time when one civilization has died off and the next one's kind of coming up okay. so it's such an interesting game so yeah if you ever get any time <laughs> i tend to be more of a sort of adrenaline ah for, okay for, for, yeah. um, computer games shoot, shoot I, the gun. I do like blowing things up <laughs> and i tend not to have patience for um role-playing games in on, on computers though i mean the last of us was brilliant storytelling. I mean, there was plenty of action as well, yes. zombies coming at you, but but that one was the probably the only time I've ever played a game where the story was sort of mm. the best thing about it, even though the gameplay was really good as yeah. well. But that, that one really sort of, to me, took the genre up a notch because it was basically like watching a really good series on, on yeah. TV. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame sometimes when um, obviously the the TV um, series of The Last of Us was phenomenal as well. But um, just thinking more recently, there was a very very bad Walking Dead game that came out, <laughs> and sometimes you're just like, oh, that's almost like a yeah. It's, I think it's good it went the other it? way with the, the Last of Us because I, I feel when you go for IP, you just mm. tend to try and ride the uh, the wave and put less effort in it because you spent so much money on acquiring it that you yes and so games based on successful films are often rubbish yeah but when you go in the other direction it, it can work quite well mm. yeah definitely definitely um but well thank you mark for joining us today we've obviously got a ton of <laughs> stuff to, to now sign um but for anyone watching at home there will be links below um to order you just have a copy of either book one or book two or we do have some other books for Mark to sign over there um but yeah check them out on our website and in all of our stores very soon um but we shall see you next time bye if you're enjoying watching forbidden planet tv and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers authors artists musicians creators subscribe right here see you soon